Hello, hello, friends. So many participants today. It's great to see everybody. Uh, my name is Wesley Wolfair Pinkham, and I am the show's producer. Uh, we join together for Thursdays with Friends, uh, our online conversation on current issues with the ongoing rising levels of COVID-19 infections and deaths. We will discuss today public health and healthcare in the US. Our chat host for Thursdays with Friends is FCNL General Secretary, Diane Randall. Her guest is Dr. Michelle Coey, a medical internist and former physician in chief of Kaiser Permanente Medical Center in South San Francisco. Thank you so much and over to you, Diane. Thanks, Wesley, and welcome everyone to this first episode of Thursdays with Friends in the new year. I wanna thank you for joining us on Zoom or Facebook or YouTube, however you're making a connection with us. And I just wanna begin by saying uh, thank you to so many of you who made year end contributions to FCNL we are very deeply grateful for your financial support and want to acknowledge that um, we receive many gifts and it's very helpful to our work. I am really excited for this conversation with our special guest, Michelle Cohey. But before we begin our discussion on healthcare, which is really an urgent issue that affects every single one of us, I wanna speak briefly about what happened in the nation's capital yesterday. Like you, we were shocked and dismayed uh, to see the mob surge the Capitol, causing mayhem, violence, and disruption of the pro forma process to certify the results of the election. We have issued a new statement today that is posted. I think we can post it in the chat. It's certainly on the homepage of our website, calling for the president's removal. The gross violation of our democracy that was evidenced both by the rioters and those members of Congress who have acted on Mr. Trump's baseless lies about the election is a subject that we will be contending with for some time in the future. I just wanted to acknowledge that we are all still reeling from this um, as just as we are truly reeling from coronavirus epidemic and how it's affecting all of us. So today we're gonna to seize the opportunity to speak with Michelle Cohey. And um, I wanna just say that in addition to her illustrious career as a physician, as a retired physician, and her work as a hospital uh, uh, public health, or her work as an administrator in the Kaiser Permanente system in California, um, Michelle was a friend in Washington with FCNL. Um, and she was a friend in Washington before we all had to stop being together in Washington. Uh, she was with us on uh, the, a year ago now, uh, in January and February, and um, I will never forget Michelle's uh, awareness and concern about the growing um, news we were hearing about the virus, um, even in January and February when she was with us. But today we're going to start by talking more about some of the general public healthcare principles and um, about the status of, of healthcare in our country today. Um, and again, it's something that um, Michelle has paid a lot of attention to. Uh, 10 years ago, FCNL began working, or FCNL worked on lobbying on behalf of the Affordable Care Act, also known as Obamacare. Um, not only were we successful in getting this bill passed, but we have continued to defend it over the past four years and to see it implemented. This year has really tested the effectiveness of the Affordable Care Act in a, in a way that we might not have ever, certainly would have never hoped for. Um, and not surprisingly, it's working. And I think that's really a significant um, testament. It expands Medicaid and it offers subsidized health care plans um, and a new safety net for people who've lost their jobs and were without health insurance. We don't have the final government figures in, uh, but the independent research that, that indicates that the number of Americans uh, without medical insurance has been largely the same despite the recession where people have lost jobs and the pandemic. So I think we can safely say the Affordable Care Act works um, and it, should, it would never have happened without your advocacy and your ongoing support. 
So of course, our advocacy for a just healthcare system flows out of our belief uh, that universal access to affordable, effective, comprehensive healthcare is a right, and it's necessary to allow people to fulfill their potential. So I wanna turn now to Michelle. Uh, she is a graduate of Stanford University School of Medicine, is board certified in internal medicine, and has long worked for um, effective healthcare policy, as well as, as we said, being a practice, or formerly a practicing internist. Um, and significantly, she's also on our general committee, which we're really happy about. Uh, and so she's a part of our governor. So um, welcome, Michelle. And let's dig in, just talk right now about um, the pandemic and what, what's it doing to our healthcare system today? Well, thank you, Diane. And it is wonderful to see you safe, uh, you. Uh, far away, uh, watching the television. Uh, we were all afraid for you and for your staff. And so uh, I wanna say how grateful I am to see you. Uh, uh, the, um, now turning to the pandemic, I was also gonna say that violence actually is a medical problem as well. And if you think about our uh, systems being overwhelmed, with the uh, COVID in infections, especially right now with this great peak. And yesterday, the greatest, the largest number of deaths in the nation. Um, it reminds us that, that we're all humans, that we're the same species, and that that virus which started presumably in China, but that was gonna affect all of us and we knew it, we could have done much better, but we're, we know that there are many people across the country who have medical personnel who are providing care to others despite the risk to themselves. They suffer right along with the families of their, with their loss. It is physically and emotionally exhausting. And we are deeply grateful to these providers of care. The loss of life and livelihood has affected everyone and we must look forward to a better model of care that doesn't share these weaknesses. So Michelle, you know, when we were talking about this, I, I just wanna underscore something you said to us about a sense of calling that many people in the healthcare profession feel. It's certainly something we feel about our work at FCNL, but I, I just wanna acknowledge that for many it's a, I assume it's like an emotional or spiritual sense of, of wanting to serve and help others. Well, I think that's true, Diane. Um, and I've witnessed that firsthand throughout my career, watching others provide care so selflessly. You, it also reminds me that the lobbying that we do is also from a sense of caring for others beyond ourselves. And so we share that together which is one of the things that we think makes it so powerful is that, um, is that we aren't asking necessarily for something for ourselves, but, but um, there is an element of, of really seeking a better world in, in, this, in this advocacy. So Michelle, based on your long experience and your work with FCNL, you helped us identify um, some core principles for healthcare. And I'd like you to just, uh, these are available on FCNL's website and they help give us guidance, but I'd like you to talk a little bit about those and um, feel free to expand however you'd like to. Okay, well, we'll start with three core principles. Uh, the first is that all people, no exceptions, it's like loving thy neighbor, uh, shall have access to quality healthcare. And that that quality healthcare must be affordable. It has to be affordable or it cuts into other people's livelihoods. And there must be a robust public health infrastructure. So these, these principles are critical as to how we look at healthcare and it varies depending, the outcome of your care varies depending on who you are, where you got sick, what hospital you were taken to. And we, this all played out in the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Um, we do know, as you had said earlier, that expanding Medicaid coverage in particular and, and uh, coverage for low-income people did improve health outcomes. And we, will, we don't know currently whether that affected COVID outcomes in terms of improving where there was Medicaid expansion or having fewer deaths versus, for example, Texas, where there hasn't been Medicaid expansion, but we will find out. And finally, 
the healthcare system must be supported by public health agencies, such as the National Institutes of Health and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, which uh, allows us to do public health in an appropriate way. This is where we've had our greatest failure in this pandemic, not in the treatment and not in the coverage. Right, and I hope we can get into this discussion a little bit more about sort of where, what, what are the principle, why public health isn't better recognized. I mean, you spoke about the funding at the federal level and certainly that is something of concern to us. And we, we have advocated, um, in addition to advocating for the Affordable Care Act, we've also advocated for Indian health, uh, further funding for Indian health as, mm -hmm. as a, something that's really important. But this question of public health, of course, is, is uh, we, we, would be, we would be focused on the federal level, but it's also a concern at a, at a local level. I mean, there are state departments of public health and local departments of public health. And, you know, certainly, you know, I guess one of my hopes and expectations is that out of this pandemic, mm -hmm. there may be a greater awareness of that vital functioning of public health um, in so many realms, clearly around the pandemic, but in other areas like violence that you named. So I think, I think really, um, talked about some of the health disparities that we've seen that have so uh, been magnified by the deaths and uh, suffering um, in black, brown and indigenous communities. Do you wanna talk a little bit more about that? And, and um, you know, what, what, just what are we seeing? Well, the facts are out, they're very clear that uh, people at the lower end of the socioeconomic scale and those with chronic uh, conditions or poor health uh, have poor outcomes and that those um, in black, brown and indigenous people have higher uh, rates of chronic illness. And so they are at much greater risk. And uh, also we know people at the lower end of socioeconomic uh, scale may be in crowded housing conditions, may, may not be able to isolate in the way we have, may not have uh, ac immediate access to care and certainly don't have access to the kind of care that President Trump and Rudy Giuliani had when they became ill to have experimental, very high cost treatment. And so we know there are a number of reasons for um, these disparities. Um, and I think it is of concern. Uh, and we the irony is that we now know that by expanding coverage, we can reduce to some extent these, these healthcare disparities. And still many states have not opted to increase their Medicaid uh, enrollments, not opted into the program. Yeah. Which is just shocking given the fact that the Affordable Care yeah. Act actually provided significant incentives Virtually. for states to, mm -hmm. to join without having putting an extra burden on the states. And it just, um, it's just hard to fathom why, why a state would not uh, accept that, uh, especially, and I would think many of them are feeling some regret about that. Um, I wanna talk about cost because that's clearly a huge problem. Um, and I, I, I think we'll talk a little bit about the COVID relief package. I just want to name, you know, going back to that public health issue and relationship. I know one of the things that in addition to um, uh, the lobbying that we were doing, you know, that was focused on access to uh, food benefits, SNAP, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, and into income through unemployment benefits, we were very concerned about eviction prevention. And um, just thinking about, you know, the populations that you talked about and thinking about um, if, if a household is evicted, um, they may end up on the street or they may end up in a sh shelter, but they are more likely to end up doubled up with family and friends and transitioning from one place to another in more crowded conditions. And so in some ways that element of eviction prevention and rent relief truly is a health care um, benefit, I guess you might say, even though we wouldn't think of it that way. But tell us a little bit more about, you've been uh, tracking what's gone in, what's in that COVID package and talk a little bit about what you've, what you've seen. Well, the most uh, surprising thing in the COVID package was the uh, amendment about that bans surprise billing, which is something that we talked about when I was a friend in Washington, where folks are treated in usually an emergency room uh, in the place where they thought they should go based on their insurance coverage and uh, out of network uh, providers unbeknownst to them then take the insurance money and also then 
balance bill, what's called balance bill. Uh, and there's no cap on that bill. Um, so, but I think, uh, I think we should talk about affordability in broader sense. The, uh, the, the Affordable Care Act, while it does uh, provide for uh, Medicaid expansion and subsidies for low-income folks, has become increasingly unaffordable for middle-income people because the employer-based coverage has become increasingly expensive and uh, co-pays and uh, deductibles and all those things have significantly cut into families' income. Same can be said for some Medicare beneficiaries. And although Medicare is a very uh, good program, there are many people who still have problems affording drug, drugs, for example, especially high priced drugs. And we know that we need reform in the pharmaceutical industry uh, to keep uh, drug, drug costs down. So, uh, so there's, lots, uh, there's lots there. There's not much else in the COVID relief bill except that vaccines, as you know, are supposed to be free. Uh, some places uh, are, uh, prob are probably charging for administration uh, and, uh, and they're, they're gonna be called out, I hope. Um, but that's, a, I wanna go back to, if you don't mind, I wanna go back to the, um, the CDC and our public health infrastructure. The CDC is an advisor, almost in an advisory role. It has no uh, real clout. And so that the guidelines, especially around vaccination are just that, they're guidelines. And I think the recent, I haven't looked this week, but they were all still in draft form. And so it is a free for all out there. Every state, every county and even municipality and healthcare system can decide who gets the vaccine first. Uh, and I think it's gonna to lead to confusion and, and other kinds of difficulties. So uh, Michelle, I know that the ethics of healthcare are something of interest to you. And clearly this question about vaccines is there's an ethical dimension here. And I mean, you know, what, what's, your, what's your sense about, about this? And, and, you know, I mean, this is a, this is a tough question. Is that well, all ethical questions are by definition tough questions because there are interests and, and complications on all sides. Um, I, you know, I, I think um, we, we don't, there, there is no single answer. Uh, if you think about the people who are most at risk, the very elderly, um, uh, I, you know, they're, I think it's pretty clear that the number of lives saved by vaccinating very elderly people will be great. But then who's next? There's that, that gray area. And of course we want to protect our healthcare workers because though we, you know, it's going to take a while before everyone is immune. Um, and, um, and so I think that that's pretty clear, but then who's next? Is it children? Is it teachers? Is it frontline workers? Uh, I think we're, everybody's going to have, everybody who considers it is gonna have a slightly different uh, opinion. So I guess I just will come back to the CDC. Are you saying that if we had a, a better funded and more robust um, understanding of public health and support for the Center for Disease Control, we might actually see stronger guidance or clearer guidance or well, I mean, I think given, be... given, given federalism, I guess, is my question that there's a, there's an argument yeah. made that states should get to control what they do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think um, in a pandemic such as we had, federal leadership would have been helpful, um, not just uh, for uh, the CDC, which provided the guidance, but potentially uh, for some other mechanism for the federal government, in fact, to uh, focus, focus efforts, whether it's mask uh, wearing, whether it's um, other sorts of, uh, you know, social distancing, you know, a, 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 a comprehensive and uh, approach to how we were going to deal with their recommendations, I think would have been very helpful to local agencies. Uh, but there was no leadership, and we certainly uh, out of the White House. And it's it's right. a 
it's a tragedy. It's been estimated that uh, we'll have at least half a million uh, deaths by, uh, in the United States alone, uh, probably more, and that half of those could have been prevented. And those are people's mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, spouses, and friends. It, it is just hard to, um, hard to make meaning out of this. And, and I guess the, you know, I don't, I, we don't have too much time, but I, but I, I do want to turn, you know, stay, I, I, I want to turn to the, what's coming with the um, president elect Biden. Um, clearly the transition team has been very focused on how they will address COVID as well as, I mean, we're hearing more about the immediate needs of addressing COVID and the notion of trying to do a million uh, vaccines a day and, and discussion about whether there would be, you know, you know, is that, can there be a national mask mandate or how does, how does that get, you know, um, put into place? Um, I want to just acknowledge that we have had a couple questions or comments in the chat. And one of them was that um, Israel seems to be very successful uh, other than supporting the Palestinians. They are and their need for vaccines. They've been successful in doing vaccinations. I don't know if you want to comment both on um, sort of what you might, what we might see once uh, Biden is inaugurated um, in terms of this ability to do that many vaccines and and also uh, just how, as, an, as, a, as an administrator in a healthcare system, how, how can you make that happen? Right. Uh, well, we should have been planning for this all along. It's not a surprise that we're gonna have a vaccine. And the fact that uh, there hasn't been a plan, I think is, is really uh, a tragedy. Um, but um, I think that the, the rollout uh, could take advantage of logistics personnel and you know who does logistics really well? I hate to say this in a Quaker uh, setting, but the military. And uh, they, you know, I think that could have, the distribution of the vaccine could, could go more smoothly with logistical support. Um, and then, um, you know, dollars, and this is, I saw that you, you had something on the chat there, that, um, that there, is, there is needed support for the vaccine administration. So, the transportation seems to be cure for it to, to be okay, but the administration of the vaccine is done by people and they need to be paid. And um, that, that is, you know, that needs to be generous and immediate. So. I'm starting to talk, but I was on mute. So sorry about that. <laughs> um, uh, so let's let's uh, I, I, I want to offer I want to extend an offer to people to ask questions. So please put your questions in the chat if you have a question for Michelle or a, a comment. Um, I, I do think you know someone asked about um, kind of where the authority for some of these public health measures come from, and I think it'd be helpful if you could address that question of authority that we talked a little bit about in terms of federal and state, and you know what can be mandated versus what can be. Uh, created as a norm, so to speak. And so I think specifically, if you, if you want to talk about that with regard to mask wearing or, or, or getting vaccines, you know, um, that would be helpful to think about. Yeah, I'm not sure I'm an expert in the, in, in the sort of, as you say, the federalism notion, um, because uh, I think, unfortunately, Trump was probably right that the governors had that um, authority and uh, the federal government, unless it uh, uh, would invoke some sort of national emergency, which could have been done, um, that there could have been a national mandate. But uh, certainly uh, the states, I think, had that authority. I think we missed that opportunity. Now, you know, it's so, it's, it's, there's, there's no uh, reason to trace and to test because it's just so, uh, it's circulating so widely in our communities. And uh, we all need to protect uh, ourselves and our loved ones and others uh, by wearing masks um, and by social distancing and so on, washing our hands. Um, I wanted to say also, uh, as we had talked about earlier, that uh, under the Biden administration, I think we will see a strong support for the Affordable Care Act. And I think, uh, you know, he was a, an, a part of one of the architects of the Affordable Care Act. And I think we can see that he will uh, probably want to improve on it, but that uh, it's not going anywhere. 
What about um, Medicare for all that gained so much attention during the during the election season, and certainly among the Democrats? Um, I know you've thought that probably that is not something that Biden would push, but what what do you what do you think about that? Yeah, I think there's a small chance uh, that the the age could be redu- you know cut down to age sixty mm. and above, as opposed to age sixty five and over the eligibility. Uh, but uh, I, I think that's unlikely. It's a very expensive program, uh, and um, you may not be a deficit hawk, but we do need to worry about the cost of uh, of the care provided by the federal government. So. Um, I, I think that would be a, a hard hard sell in the Congress, uh, especially mm-hmm, with mm-hmm. these looming with these looming deficits. Uh, well, and looming demands. I mean, sir, you know, just I, I know I I, I want to acknowledge that we do have a we always have an ask around advocacy, and um, Stephen has just put that in the chat, and that is for additional uh, funding to support the administration of vaccines. That Amelia has put that together, but. Um, you know, Amelia Keegan, our domestic policy director and who leads our economic justice work, you know, we had a conversation just earlier today about the, the demands that we're going to see to begin to address some of the economic needs of households that, you know, are not going to go away even when the vaccine comes. These are going to be, econo- there's an economic fallout for people who are middle class, as you noted, and people who are low income that's going to persist beyond the time even that everyone is vaccinated, even if the vaccines are free. And so, there's, a, there's gonna be a real demand from the sort of Economic Justice Act to say nothing of the other critical issues that FCNL pays attention to um, and are concerned about. So I know these are all, all significant. Um, Michelle, we're almost out of time here. <laughs> and uh, so I just, I, I'd love to offer you an opportunity to talk a little bit about anything else that, you know, you, we've covered a lot from making sure that public health is funded to uh, looking at you know support of our healthcare providers and recognizing that they are um, mission driven and are really serving us in a very profound way, and that part of what we can do is wear masks <laughs> and keep our social distance. And um, so I'm just want to open it up to you and um, ask if there's any remarks that you'd like to make before we close out. Um, well, I wanted to say thank you to FCNL for uh, having me as a friend in Washington uh, because I learned that working with you, we can all make a difference. And this is one area that I happen to be passionate about, but you cover many, many different areas. And so, um, so thank you for your work. Um, I do think that healthcare now is about 20% of the gross domestic product and That can't go up at the rate it's been going up forever. And as a country, we're gonna have to take a hard look at how we provide care, how we prevent illness and disease, and how we cope with national catastrophes such as this, because there will be more. So thank you. Well, thank you. And thank you for that encouragement about about the advocacy. Um, I will say that I had the opportunity well, actually, you and I were both on, um, on every Wednesday, we have a time of silent reflection that's open to anyone who wants to per, uh, participate. And I, I'm sure there were other people um, on this call who might've been on that as well. But um, that, that's an open time. And it was really great to be with that community. And then we also um, had uh, a time last night with our advocacy teams. And we had you know people from over 40 states, 300 households last night. And it, despite the havoc and the really sense of terror that I think many of us felt yesterday, being with one another in community and understanding that we are committed to working for the world we seek in terms of our advocacy makes such a tremendous difference. And um, so I, I thank you for being with us and invite you to um, you know, to stay engaged. And I invite everyone who's on the call to, to join us again in two weeks uh, for our Thursdays with friends um, and to stay tuned for other events that we're doing um, throughout, the, throughout the next couple few weeks. We're gonna be doing more um, Quaker Changemaker events and more Learn to Lobby events. And um, even during this pandemic, I feel really blessed that we've been able to stay connected with so many of the people who are part of our network and supporters and advocates. And so we hope 
we, we really do want to sustain that and continue it. Um, and I know we're gonna capture the chat because we've had some last minute comments that I think are really powerful ways for us to think about this work going forward. So ask our staff to make sure that we capture those. And if there are people who have comments or questions that we'll try to get back to you. But um, again, uh, with gratitude, uh, Michelle, for your work with us and for um, your sense of mission to this. Thank you. Thank you. Bye everyone.